Beowulf comes in at a really critical part of uh, European history, um, but also more narrowly English history. The story of uh, a bunch of raiders from Northern Europe is uh, essentially an English story because it is it was found, the manuscript was found in England. It was told in uh, a, an archaic form of English, uh, written in an archaic form of English, and uh, is sort of a founding epic of uh, the English people, as it were. And it is a portrait of not just going back in time, of, you know, based on origin stories of nation states, not unlike the, uh, um, uh, the Iliad or the Aeneid or what have you, but it is a, uh, it's more a portrait of beneath the surface. It is a portrait of the, uh, the later English Isles and the process of Christianization that was going on at around the time of its composition, when the Roman uh, uh, the Roman Republic began to contract at the end of the uh, the Empire, not the Roman Republic, when uh, when the Empire began to uh, contract and it pulled out of England, it left a little bit of a vacuum there, and you uh, you see this slow encroachment of uh, other peoples broken up largely into uh, uh, pagan barbarians from the north of Europe uh, who tend to go under the more popular term Vikings these days, all generalized, uh, but also a Christian element from the further south of Europe. And it is really this mix that this poem comes out of. And it's a, uh, it's, it's remarkable in many ways. It's, it's, it's very rough edged in many ways, but what emerges is a portrait of a culture in a great state of turmoil, struggling to deal with competing influences and a sense of identity emerging out of that. Um, the uh, the original in Old English is uh, pretty foreign to English speakers today. It's almost uh, untranslatable in many respects. One translation uh, tends to go from uh, very wide traditions to another. There can be a very uh, very a wide gulf between uh, interpretations and uh, and word by word transliterations. The uh, the one that we're working with in the Norton anthology is Seamus Heaney's, who does a uh, a remarkable job in trying to capture a uh, something of the meter and the feel and the alliteration of the original. All of these are poetic qualities that the uh, the original really leans on. Uh, much more so than in uh, in contemporary poetry today, we tend to think more in terms of rhyme and uh, and assonance and certain other uh, uh, respects that aren't as familiar to uh, to the uh, the old English. But um, but in doing so, he's also importing certain words that are equally unfamiliar today to English speakers because they're coming from his, uh, his Gaelic uh, background. His, uh, as a, uh, he uses many, uh, many Irish words in there that are equally curious, but, sort, but speak on a certain level to the uh, familiarity of that world, the archaic sense of it, and the somewhat uh, deliberately uh, anti-civilized version of it that is very much anti-English in a way. Uh, the, trying to get back to a sense of the barbarians beneath. Um, 
my favorite word, honestly, comes in the very first syllable, which is a great way to start a poem. And I would uh, encourage everyone to, you can Google, there are recordings of this in, in the original uh, language, um, people reading it in the old English. And that first word is what? H-W-A-E-T or something like that. And the orthography is going to be very different. And the, uh, the letters are all a little bit weird. Um, but that great sense of what? Um, you can make it softer. But there's something about that gusto to it that is a terrific virility to it. Like uh, here it is simply translated by Haney as so. It's declarative, it's demonstrative, it's a throat clearing moment, uh, but uh, so kind of loses the, the power of what? Um, it's fun to say. Uh, I always say, you know, even if you don't, even if you don't speak or understand the words, uh, it's fun to try and pronounce them out loud. Um, so the spear Danes in days gone by. So automatically you're told that at the time that this poem was composed, and there's a lively debate as to whether it was oral or written initially, and there's there are those debates going on all over the place, but there's an automatic recognition that this poem is dialing into that familiar trope of long, long ago, you know, uh, once upon a time, distant past. So it's automatically recalling to something very ancient, something that has the uh, august feel of authority to it. Um, long ago in, in days gone by and the kings, the spear Danes in days gone by and the kings who ruled them had courage and greatness, had courage and greatness, past tense. Um, do they not have courage and greatness uh, today or in the day of when this was written or composed or however you want it? It's automatically, you know, a little accusatory. Um, we have heard of those princes heroic campaigns. We have heard. We is plural, so it automatically opens it up to not just the poet himself, whoever that may be, but um, the culture at large, the people, the early English people. Um, we have heard, and it references specifically its story-like quality. Um, there was Shield Sheafson, scourge of many tribes, a wrecker of mead benches, rampaging among foes. A uh, wrecker of mead benches. That is that means he, he, he killed a, he got of his he got a lot of his own people killed. Um, scourge of many tribes means you're killing other tribes. Wrecker of mead benches, you're probably killing them, you're probably losing a few of your own in the process. Um, uh, rampaging among foes. He was a very effective warrior. He was perhaps a little brutal, perhaps a little barbaric, um, but it, it worked. This was the world he was in. He was seems to have been in his element. A foundling to start with, meaning he was just, you know, he, he didn't necessarily have parents. He came from nowhere. He started up and pulled himself up by his own bootstrap, so to speak. Also, kind of uh, a Moses figure almost, some people point out, saying that, well, the, uh, uh, the familiarity of the Moses story would have informed this. Um, he would flourish later on as his powers waxed and his worth was proved. He was younger, he would get greater. In the end, each clan on the outlying coast beyond the whale road had to yield to him and begin to pay tribute. That was one good king. That's a declarative sentence at the end of that little stanza that says, that was one good king. Why? What is the criteria here? What's the rubric we're going by? Well, he was, uh, he was, he was very brutal, very violent, um, but he, uh, he, Earn the respect of his people. He was able to defend his people against attacks, and he was able to attack 
with his people to uh, enrich them. Uh, and that's really quite key. Uh, and beyond the whale road means, uh, well, the whale road is just the sea, the water. Um, these are a seafaring people. And you set up camp, you hang out for a little while until it gets warm enough to sail, and then you hit the road and you go looking around for uh, other encampments along the uh, along the shore that you can attack uh, and uh, rob, steal from, you know, rape and pillage. Um, they, you get this uh, portrait of uh, of a very violent culture, of a culture built on uh, raiding, which is what the early Vikings were honestly they were raiders and they uh it was a very brutal life uh but it was a fairly well organized one they had remarkably um sophisticated methods of uh government for their time it was all tribal um but for dealing among tribes they had uh, kind of a, essentially a parliament, early days uh, parliament, where different tribal leaders would gather together and work out uh, issues with themselves, with among themselves. Um, the uh, the different tribes would have a way, um, this social mechanism of negotiating and trying to diffuse and tamp down. Um, violence among them. Um, Shield had father to son. Bayo's name was na known throughout the worth, throughout the north, and a young prince must be prudent like that, giving freely while his father lives, so that afterwards, in age when fighting starts, steadfast companions will stand by him and hold the line. Behavior that's admired is the path to power among people everywhere. Now, this is interesting because you get a sense of, well, what, what is part of what being a good king is. Um, you give freely. The king, the leader, would go out on these raids or would at least be uh, um, the nominal force behind them. And he would get the lion's share then of the uh, of the uh, of the booty, and he would be generous with it. He would give it out. You get a lot of different epithets in here uh, of uh, the king being the various kings being you know a a a ring giver or some such uh, uh, concoction as that where you get the sense that they're taking in a lot, but they're giving a lot back to their people, uh, and thus uh, incurring loyalty. But in that, you can see also a remarkably transactional culture. Um, these people aren't necessarily loyal for any particular reason. The poem itself says, you know, behavior that's admired is the path to power among people everywhere. So be good because it will get you power. Not be good for goodness sake, be good because you'll get something in return. Give out and you can get back. Um, giving freely while his father lives so that, that so that is a deal, is a transaction, is a, it's a bargain. It's saying you do something for me, I will do something for you. And that's how you hold power. Um, Shield was still thriving when his time came and he crossed over into the Lord's keeping. And here you see a particularly uh, Christian characterization of this, where it's never quite sure how Christian this text is on the surface. You get, um, you know, the, in the Lord's keeping, that's a fairly um, Judeo-Christian characterization. You don't tend to get um, a lot of explicitly and exclusively Christian references. Um, you're not going to see an awful lot of New Testament stuff in here, but there there are considerable references to an Old Testament tradition, 
where you can imagine also that of you know uh, the composers in the year 700 England or wherever are trying to play to the audience that they have and they can guarantee that there will be a broader field of awareness probably of Old Testament uh, virtues and texts than New Testament. Excuse me. Um, but at the same time, you also get repeated references to uh, uh, pagan culture, to this warrior ethos of, uh, of the Vikings and the, all the Germanic tribes across the, uh, the north of Europe. Um, you know, case in point, right down here, uh, Shields Funeral. They stretched their beloved Lord in his boat laid out by the mast amidships and the great ring giver. Far-fetched treasures were piled upon him in treasures gear. I have never heard before of a ship so well furbished with battle tackle, bladed weapons, and coats of mail. This is a, a Viking funeral, essentially. They're, they're loading up a, uh, a, uh, a small boat, a small ship, with, uh, with treasure for, uh, and they're, they're going to put the, uh, the body on it and then just send it out to sea. Some traditions have it where they set the boat on fire. Here, you just have the boat uh, going off into uh, who knows where. Um, you know, the mass treasure was loaded on top of him. It would travel far out onto the ocean's sway. They decked his body no less bountifully with offerings than the first ones did who cast him away when he was a child, sarcasm maybe, and launched him alone out on the, uh, over the waves. Uh, no man can tell, no wise man in hall or weathered veteran knows for certain who salvaged that load. Which is interesting because it's supposed to escort him, as the pagan tradition would have it, um, into the next world. But here already there's this little glancing reference to, well, yeah, that's uh, okay, it's taking him over into the afterlife, perhaps. But um, that ship probably landed ashore somewhere, and somebody was really excited to find it. Um, so a little sense of a, uh, there was a pagan practice in the funeral, but not necessarily all that much belief. Um, <clears throat> Shield son Bayo, uh, uh, Led for, uh, led for a while, and then his heir, the great half-dane, held sway for as long as he lived, their elder and warlord. He was four times a father, this fighter prince, one by one, they entered the world, Her Herorgar, Hrothgar, and good Halga, and a daughter. I have heard who was Onella's queen, a balm in the bed of his battle-scarred Swede. So in that, you know, battle-scarred Swede, and uh, half Dane, you get a sense of the uh, the tribal alliances going on here and the tribal loyalties. Uh, this is Denmark. The people were early Danes, um, and if uh, if this uh, the one heir, the great half Dane, ha happened to have a mother who was a Swede, perhaps. He would be marked as well. Okay, you're, you're half Dane. Not quite uh, pure blood, as it were. Um, Harry Potter types would call this perhaps a mud blood, but it's a sense of very much a tribal culture. You are different than I am because you come from somewhere else. Um, fortunes of war favored Hrothgar, friends and kinsmen, kinsmen flocked to his ranks, young followers, a force that grew to be a mighty army. So his mind turned to hall building. He handed, great, he handed down orders for men to work on a great mead hall, meant to be a wonder of the world forever. Um, a great mead hall, a hall, a large room where um, men could gather. Uh, this is a tribal culture. Uh, this is a largely traveling culture where people would, as I said, 
They would spend the summer months you know, trekking around the shoreline looking for places to rape and pillage. And they spent a lot of time together. And a hall in that kind of uh, life where you are on the go an awful lot, a hall is a uh, remarkable structure just for its purpose, which is, of course, a purpose to stay together, but stay safe and enjoy a little comfort together. The life on the road could be very violent. Life on the road, you were very exposed to the elements quite often. Um, and in Northern Europe, the elements were pretty unfavorable. So a hall, a large, usually, you know, sometimes just a single room could be awfully drafty at that. Um, but a place where you could gather together, where you could enjoy a little fellowship, a little common culture. There would be perhaps a bard to sing a story about tales of heroes of old. Um, it would be a, uh, a uniting principle. Um, also a symbol of some uh, civilization, some government, some uh, organization beyond the simple, you know, warlord uh, characterization of society. But you also see this impulse to build something that could be um, remarkable, something that would be respected, something that would earn him perhaps some fame. And here the echoes of Gilgamesh are all over because that phrase meant to be a wonder of the world for uh, of the world forever it's an aspiration as a king he wants more than just going out and you know winning the latest uh, uh, winning the latest prize he wants to be special he wants his people to have some place to come together and be together and be safe together. It's, it's somewhat idealistic. Uh, and it's not all pure ego and selfish. There's something quite, you know, uh, admirable there. Um, it would be his throne room, and there he would dispense his God-given goods to young and old, but not the common land or people's lives. He's not giving away slaves, he's not giving away land that he owns. Um, it's still going to be a rigidly uh, aristocratic society uh, for what it is. Um, he would favor, however, his, uh, his men, his knights, if it, uh, as you will, um, his warriors. They are called thanes here. Um, he understands that he has to give something back to get their service, their loyalty, because eh, there's not a lot of force of law here. There's not a lot of sophistication, not a lot of civilization where he can compel someone beyond their own self-interest. He makes it, he makes their self-interest his self-interest. And this is how you gain power. Um, as soon as it stood there, finished and ready, in full view, the Hall of Halls. Herat was its name. He had settled on it, whose utterance was law. Nor did he renege, but doled out rings and torques at the table. The hall towered, its gables wide and high and awaiting, a barbarous burning. The doom abided, but in time it would come. The killer instinct unleashed among in-laws. The bloodlust rampant. Uh, that is foreboding. That is uh, a hint of things to come. Not necessarily in this story, but hinting at a shared uh, legendary history that his audience, that the, the bard's audience singing Beowulf, he composed the original composer's audience, would know the story. And so it's swimming around in their head every time they're, they're hearing, oh yeah, Halfdane, Hrothgar, yeah, this group. Uh, they know the context, they know the, this isn't the backstory, this is further forestory, I guess, because it happens in uh, also the ancient past, but a little less past. Um, they, the audience knows what's coming. 
So this is a little hint to uh, the audience to say, you know, I, I know you know all of these things. Hold with me. You know, we'll get to this eh, more or less. You know the context. Let it play in the back of your head. Um, but significantly, this, uh, this is a story of right here. The story that they're hinting at is one of uh, fratricide, brothers killing brothers. Um, it's division and resentment. Uh, and, it, and it's coming out as just a little note that's dropped in at the end of this image of building the hall, the hall which is a place of unity and, um, and, and, yeah, and, and brotherly loyalty, family bonds. Uh, humanity in uh, in its you know in it, in its broadest sense, and the the name Herit of course means heart. It this is supposed to be the heart of the civilization, the heart of the culture, and it is essentially just a you know a oh it's a wondrously beautiful building that's probably just a big ramshackle drafty shack, but. It's warm because of all the people who come in it and all the people who bring their body warmth into it and their fellowship into it and who can tell stories and sing songs and drink and bring something human to a otherwise very harsh world. Uh, and it was on that note of sudden division and resentment that you get this appearance of a monster. Monster shows up and then a powerful demon, a prowler through the dark, nursed a hard grievance. It harrowed him to hear the din of the loud banquet every day in the hall, the heart being struck and the clear song of a skilled poet telling with mastery of man's beginnings how the Almighty had made the earth a gleaming plain girdled with waters in his splendor he set he set out the sun and the moon to the earth's lamplight, lanterns for men, and filled the broad lap of the world with branches and leaves and quickened life to every to every other thing that moved. So right there, that's a uh, a, uh, a Spark Notes version of Genesis one. Um, but the tales of uh, creation, the tales of man and uh, men's uh, specialness and men's relation to God in Genesis um, elicit this reaction, this, uh, this counterbalance of uh, grievance. This monster, a powerful demon who hears the din of the loud banquet he hears people partying, people hanging out and enjoying one another's company, and this demon all alone resents it. It's grievance, and this negativity drives him out. So times were pleasant for the people there until finally one, a fiend out of hell. Oh, demon? Began his work began to work his evil in the world. Grendel was the name of this grim demon, haunting the marches, marauding around the heath and the desolate fens. He had dwelt for a time in misery among the burnished monsters, Cain's clan, whom the creator had outlawed and condemned as outcasts. So now we had a little uh, retelling of early Genesis, and now we're leaping forward to a mention of Cain, which is Genesis 4. And it is, he's the first murderer. He, he kills his brother. He, uh, he is cursed by God. And he is an outcast. And so this monster named Grendel is all of that now by association. He is a uh, descendant of Cain and is a... Uh, He's an outcast. So he is an outcast from society, and it is the sounds of society that inspire him 
to violence. He hears it. You can see him like, you know, nobody invited me to the party. And he acts out. He lashes out based on that sense of resentment. Um, for the killing of Abel, the eternal Lord had exacted a price. Cain got no good from committing that murder because the Almighty had made him anathema. And out of the curse of his exile, there sprang ogres and elves. And that's later Genesis. Uh, we don't need to go in that. So after nightfall, Grendel set out for the lofty house to see how the ring Danes were settling into it after their drink. It was a heavy drinking culture. It's, it's a lot of guys who are sitting around and, you know, it's what they do. Uh, after their drink, and there he came upon them, a company of the best asleep from their feasting, insensible to pain and human sorrow. Suddenly then the God-cursed brute was creating havoc, greedy and grim. He grabbed thirty men from their resting places and rushed to his lair, flushed up and inflamed from the raid, blundering back with the butchered corpses. Monster comes in, grabs all these uh, guys, drags them out, slaughters them, tosses them back. Um, insensible, insensate violence. Uh, just pure destruction. There's no, uh, no rhyme or reason to it beyond that. It is simply fury begotten by resentment, uh, a purely negative force. Um, then as dawn brightened and the day broke, Grendel's powers of destruction were plain, their wassail was over, they wept to heaven and mourned under, and mourned under mourning. Their mighty prince, the storied leader, sat stricken and helpless, humiliated by the loss of his guard, bewildered and stunned, staring aghast at the demon's trail in deep distress. Which is a curious, um description for uh, the leader, the king, Hrothgar. He is uh, their mighty prince, their mighty prince, their storied leader. They, they take a second beat with that, a second clause um, to build it up, sat stricken and helpless, humiliated. They're really you know, contrasting after setting up you know, uh, mighty and storied. Now they're undercutting all of that with these terms. You know, he was bewildered and stunned, humiliated, stricken, helpless, uh, in deep distress. He's just a victim. And you get a sense that, oh, well, he's been on the throne for a while now. Maybe he's getting to be a little old. Um, he can't seem to fight back. He can't protect his people anymore. Um, in a purely transactional culture, that's a problem. He has been buying them off for a long time, keeping them fat and happy and going back out again for him. But if, uh, if they're all just dying, it's hard to see how he's going to be able to stay in power for very long. Um, it's a, it's impotent leadership at this point. And, real distress. Um, malignant by Grendel struck again uh, one night later. Malignant by nature, he never showed remorse. It was easy It was easy then to, to meet with a man shifting himself to a safer distance to bed in the bodies who, for who could be blind to the evidence of their eyes, the obviousness of the hall watcher's hate. Whoever escaped kept kept a weather eye open and moved away. Nobody's stepping up. Everybody's suddenly uh, not so anxious to go to the hall anymore. Eh, I'll, I'll stay outside the hall. At night, Grendel comes to the hall, picks up his victims, drags them out, slaughters them, um, and comes back the next night and does it again. This goes on for 12 years, twelve winters, seasons of woe, the Lord of the Shieldings suffered under his load of sorrow, and so before long the news was known over the whole world. Um, the story's getting around. 
It's uh, it's pure barbarism. There, they're no longer this great civilization. They're getting their reputation, which they had sought for uh, building the hall, was going to make them seem like this great culture. But now they're getting a reputation of being just um, a death trap. Grendel would never parley or make peace with any Dane, nor stop his death dealing, nor pay the death price. He won't negotiate. He won't um, enter into contracts. He won't enter into agreements. The death price is a um, uh, death price is uh, it's exactly what it says. Honestly, um, the the notion of Vergelt was in practice then, where if among tribes, if uh, somebody kills somebody from the tribe over there, kills my cousin, um, I can either go and kill someone of a comparable rank over on that side, or I can just go to them and say, "Well, you know, I, I'm going to kill somebody from from you um, unless you pay me." And there's there would be an administrative body set up where they would haggle and negotiate and come up with a fair price and then everybody could walk away and this was a sign of some uh some notion of justice some primitive notion of a court um but uh grendel doesn't observe any of that grendel is pure barbarism uh he is taking he is taking the, this nation back to this sense of barbarism dragging it back into its own more violent past. Um, so Grendel waged his lonely war. Uh, lonely war. Interesting, uh, interesting term. Lonely war. Granted, yes, he literally he was alone doing this, but he was lonely too. Curious word just jumps out there. Lonely war, inflicting constant cruelties on the people, atrocious hurt. He took over Herat, haunted the glittering hall after dark, but the throne itself, the treasure seat, he was kept from approaching. He was the Lord's outcast. Again, a Christianized term, the Lord's outcast. Um, he is lonely. He is acting out of that loneliness, and he's inflicting cruelty because of it. Resentment fuels violence. Um almost in a passive way. Uh, he, it's, it's the loneliness itself that seems to be striking out more than any proactive, positive uh, decision on his part. Um, the word gets around until uh, In a neighboring uh, country, uh, when he heard about Grendel, Helax Thane was on home ground over in Geatland. There was no other like him alive. In his day, he was the mightiest man on earth, high-born high and powerful. He ordered a boat that would ply the waves. He announced his plan to sail the Swan's Road, another term for the ocean, uh, or the sea. Uh, to seek out that king, the famous prince, who needed defenders. Nobody tried to keep him from going. No elder denied him, dear as he was to them. Instead, they inspected the omens and spurred his ambition to go. Kind of a pagan practice there. Curious. Whilst he moved about like the leader he was, seems to be divorced from the, uh, the pagan qualities here, uh, enlisting men the best he could find with 14 others, the warrior boarded the boat as captain, a canny pilot among coast, along coast and currents. 14 others. Ooh. He is leading a band of 14 others. Uh, pretty close to the number 12, which uh, yeah, makes me think of the a word, apostles, but that's just me. Um, time went by. The boat was on water, in, clo in close, under the cliffs. Now, just 
get this. He, uh, you get a nice image of the culture again, because first of all, uh, he is going for no apparent reason just now uh, to go and seek out and try and help these people. Um, it's not clear any other reason why at this point. So, okay, you're, expect you're expecting that. But then you get this very poetic dwelling on the seafaring nature of the voyage. Time went by, the boat was on, was on the water and in close under the cliffs. Men climbed eagerly up the gangplank, the sand churned the surf. Warriors loaded a cargo of weapons, shining war gear in the, in the vessel's hold. Then heaved out away with the will of the wood, of the wood wreathed ship over the waves with the wind behind her and foam at her neck. She flew like a bird under the curved prow and covered the distance. And on the following day at the due hour, those seafarers sighted land, sunlit cliffs, sheer crags, and looming headlands, the landfall they sought. It's just a little thing, but they dwell on the imagery of sailing, on the imagery of being at sea. Um, this is the culture really expressing what it values. Um, it's a maritime culture, and, and this is, you can, you can just smell the salt air in that. You can hear the crash of the, uh, of the waves against the hull. You can feel that lift and sway as the, go, as the boat goes over the waves, and it's, it's really quite beautiful in that moment. This is what the culture values. Um... They, uh, they come clunking onto shore when the watchman on the wall, the shieldings lookout, whose job it was to guard the sea cliffs, saw shields glittering on the gangplank and battle equipment being unloaded. He had to find out who and what the arrivals were, so he rode to the shore, this horseman of Hrothgar's, and challenged them in formal terms, flourishing his spear. Um, he's a guard. He's told to watch the coast because this is what Vikings do. They sail up and down the coast, and when they see something they want to attack, they land. And this guy's job is to defend against that, or at least watch for it. So he sees this boat coming with 15 heavily armed men. Um, he is going to be uh, unnerved, and he's going to be concerned. And he is going to challenge them because they're coming ashore. And you can have one or two reactions to this, but really not very many more. You can either go up, stick out your hand, and say, Howdy, stranger, or you can get very concerned. You can get your defenses up. You can be uh, curious as to what their intentions are. This is the opposite of Xenia. This is not going up and welcoming someone and come on in stranger this is who are you what do you want and we're ready to fight and that is very different than the greeks but this is a sign of the culture that is changing because we don't really know it yet, but Beowulf's uh, intentions are good. They are peaceful, and he is not coming as a raider. He is not coming to rape and pillage Hrothgar's people. But they don't know that. And it is that little dynamic of whether you welcome a stranger or whether you instinctively see them as an enemy. Are you naturally hostile or naturally welcoming? That's the character difference that we see dramatized in this little moment. And that is a key element that we'll see developed throughout the rest of this poem.